So it's Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. All right, we're very thankful to have Doug with us this morning, and I'm looking forward, this sounds like it's going to be a very appropriate sermon for this time and place. Thank you, Doug, for joining us. Good morning, happy Sabbath. You know, I said this in Portsmouth last week, and I'll say it here. One of the, a big adjustment for me during all this COVID, as far as preaching, is standing behind a podium. <laughs> I wander around, but I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do and stand behind the podium. Um, Steve wanted me to remind you that this sermon is free, okay, because uh, I wasn't able to come beginning of the month. So I owed you a free sermon, is what he said. So this sermon is free. It's on the house, so to speak. So um, you didn't? Oh, that's good. He was worried about hitchhiking, and I said, "Well, you know, handsome guy like you, you ought to be able to get picked up pretty easily." So um, let's open up with a word of prayer. Yeah, show a little leg. <laughs> Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, here we are on your Holy Sabbath day, Lord. Father, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that you love us so much that you carved this day out of time for us to come together as your children, Lord. Father, we are praying for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit right here, right now, Lord. Lead, guide, and direct us, Father. Especially as we open up your word, we wouldn't dream of doing this without your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, we are asking for a blessing. We are asking for a legion of holy angels to stand post around this house and around your children to protect from any evil influences that would try to invade and destroy. Father, you are greater than anything else, and we are grateful that you, to call you Father. And Father, we ask for a blessing. We pray that you are honored and glorified throughout this sermon and service here today. So, starting out, I want you to think for a minute. And some of you are going, oh, I didn't know I had to think today, you know. But I just want you to think about how long you've been an Adventist, okay? Um, I mean, did you grow up in the church? Were your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents maybe even great-great-grandparents Adventists, I don't know. You know, um, did a member of your family tree personally know Ellen White or one of the other, you know, great uh, people from our history here in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? How old were you when you learned, first learned the message that Jesus was coming back soon? Okay, were you a child? Did you learn it? In a youth Sabbath school class? Did you learn it in Pathfinders? Maybe it was a family worship time in your home? Or maybe like me, you were a little bit older, okay? I was 41 years old when I first learned that Jesus was coming back soon. Now, some people might think 41, well, that's middle age, right? But isn't 40 like the new 20 now or the new, I don't know, 40 is the new 30 or something? I just want to know what 58 is the new of, okay? Because I'm asking for a friend, all right? But it's been 17 years since I first learned that Jesus was coming back soon, okay? And now I can look back over those 17 years and I can see in my walk with Christ, I can see growth. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that I think I'm where I need to be. Or I'm not, I may not be where you might think I need to be. But by God's grace, I'm not where I was either. Okay? You know, as the saying goes, I'm not there, but I'm not where I was either. Um, but think about how old you were. Was it a few years ago? Was it a few decades ago when you first learned this truth? And Look back on your walk with Christ, and I'm confident that you can see growth in your own personal walk with Jesus. Now, one thing that's consistent 
amongst us Bible-believing Christians is that we believe that Jesus is coming back soon. Okay? We look forward to it. In fact, we call it the blessed hope. Right? Now, I'm going to rattle off a bunch of scriptures. I was supposed to bring some inserts, and I forgot them. Steve will email them, put them out for you guys later. Uh, but, you know, we're not going to have time to turn to the scriptures, uh, but I'll read them off for you. So the first one is Titus chapter 2, 11, 13, referring to the blessed hope. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation have appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Bible, we're told about the circumstances about when Christ returns, right? I mean, we're told that he will return with all of his holy angels and break through the clouds, right? We're told that this is going to be an audible event. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says that it will be at the last trump, okay? We're also told that it's going to be a visual event. Okay, Revelation 1, 7 says that every eye will see him. We're also told that this is going to be a very joyful event. Isaiah 25, 9 says, And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. He and he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. But we're also told that for some, in fact for many, this is going to be a very terrifying time. Revelation 6, 15 through 16 says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. So we know Jesus is coming back soon. The, the question is, what group do you want to be in? Okay? Do you want to be in the group that's joyful? Or do you want to be in the group that's terrified? Okay? Because the choice is yours and yours alone. I can't make it for you. You know, you can't make it for your spouse. You can't make it for your children. Every person has to make that decision themselves. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Nobody will be brought to heaven kicking and screaming. Okay? Nobody will be brought there against their will. We're told that before Christ comes, there's going to be a time of trouble. Right? Daniel chapter 2 verse 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. I pray that we are all found written in that book. Yes, Daniel 12, 1. So, are we in the time of trouble? Is this pandemic the time of trouble? Is 2020 the time of the end? Well, Matthew 24 gives us some insight in verses 6 through 8. It says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For these, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and divers places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. So even though we hear of wars and rumors of wars and there's famines and pestilences, the end is not yet, okay? These are the beginnings of sorrows, or some translations will say the beginning of birth pains, okay? Now, as a guy, I've never given birth to a child. And to that, I say, thank you, Lord Jesus, okay? I was in the delivery room when my son was born 35 years ago, okay? And listen, guys, and I'm the men's ministry leader for the conference. I don't care how much of a tough guy you think you are. 
I believe God made women much tougher than men. Okay? I, you know, <laughs> you can be a tough guy, but man, we can't compare with that. Now, when my son was born, we went through 17 and a half hours of labor. 17 and a half hours of labor. It was the hardest thing I ever went through. I mean, can you imagine how hard that was on me? Thanks. Somebody in Portland said, what about her? And I said, yeah, she was there too. Labor pains start out small, and then they grow in intensity, and they grow in frequency, and they get a little stronger and a little closer and a little stronger and a little closer, and they grow and they grow and they grow, and then they climax into something very beautiful. Right? So Jesus has described the time of trouble as labor pains. They're going to start out small, or they have already started out small. Get a little closer, a little more intensity, a little closer, a little harder, a little more, a little more, a little more, and then it's going to climax into something very beautiful. Amen. Jesus will break through the clouds with all of his holy angels, and he's coming to take us home. And that sounds great, but when's that going to happen? Soon, very soon. Oh, but how soon is soon? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Stay tuned to the sermon, and we'll see if we can answer that for you. Now, there have been people through the ages who have tried to set dates and times. And all of these people have been discredited because obviously that, those dates and times come and go, and Christ hasn't returned. Okay, Matthew 24, 36 says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angel of heaven, nor the Son of Man, but the Father only. He goes on to say that as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. People were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And then he says that the people were not aware that the flood was coming. What? Yeah. Wait a minute. I thought Noah had preached this for 120 years. Weren't they listening to him? What about today? We're preaching that Jesus is coming back soon, that this world is going to come to an end. Are you telling me that there are people out there who aren't listening to us? Are you telling me that there are people out there who are just living their lives like nothing's going on? How can that be? Our mission here on earth is to be ready. Notice I didn't say get ready. I said be ready. Hebrews in chapter 3 says, Today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Because you see, friends, Jesus is coming back soon. Oh, but how soon is soon? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Stay tuned to the sermon and we'll see if we can answer that for you. But the fact of the matter is, if Christ gave us a date and time, I'm afraid to say that some of us, and I'll raise my hand, some of us might procrastinate. We might put it off, right? I don't know about you, but I'm a procrastinator. I'm like the chief procrastinator, okay? I tried to go to a... Um, uh, one of those 12-step programs for procrastinators, but the meetings were always going to be held tomorrow. I used to say that I'm really bad at procrastinating, and then I said, no, you know what, I'm really good at this. I'm not bad at it, I'm really good at procrastinating, you know? And you know our motto, right? Why do today what we can put off till tomorrow, right? But the problem is you can't put this off. You can't put this off until tomorrow because Jesus is coming back soon. Oh, but how soon is soon? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Stay tuned to the sermon. We'll see if we can answer that for you. You know, I'm so thankful 
that when I learned this, I accepted it. But I have to wonder why others don't. And it breaks my heart. I mean, we all have family members and loved ones who don't accept this message. And I'm sure, just like me, it breaks your heart. Like I said, I'm thankful. And I wonder what the difference is between those of us who have accepted it and those of us or those who won't accept it. And I wonder if it boils down into two words. And these two words sound alike. They're spelt almost identical except for one letter. But they have two different meanings. So these two words are eminent and imminent. So one is spelled I-M-M-I-N-E-N-T, eminent. It means something is about to happen. The other word is eminent, and it's spelled I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. And it means something is within. It's operating within. It, it, it's inherent in you. Okay? Two words that are spelt, except for one letter that's spelt the same, they sound the same, but they have two different meanings. So how do, how do we break that down? So like I said, imminent with an I means something is about to happen. Jesus' return is imminent for all of us. Whether you believe it or not, it is imminent. It's going to happen. It's about to happen. But is he imminent with an A in your heart? Is he living within your heart? Because if he's eminent with an A in your heart, then he's definitely eminent with an I in your life. Right? The question boils down to this, and I had a pastor in this conference who's a friend of mine. We were having a discussion one day, and he said to me, Doug, it boils down to this. Who is sitting, or what is sitting on the throne of your heart? Is there room for Jesus on the throne of your heart? Or is that throne cluttered with all kinds of other stuff? And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, right? But maybe it's a job or a career. Maybe it's family or spouses. And, and please, don't get me wrong, okay? There's nothing wrong. You should love your family and your spouse. And we need to work hard to support ourselves and our families okay but Jesus has to come first he has to be the priority you know maybe it's secular entertainment or sports now I'm not judging anybody I'm just asking you to ask yourself who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart you know, for years, people have said, oh, Jesus is coming back soon. For years, people have looked for signs of his return. And we look around this world, and we hardly recognize this world. It doesn't look like the world I grew up in. And I'm sure you can all agree with that, especially our seasoned citizens, those who have been around the, the sun a few more times. You know, this world is really spinning out of control, isn't it? And we wonder, how much longer can this go on? Are we looking for the signs of the Sunday laws that we know are coming? Maybe there's worry and anxiety in what we're seeing. Perhaps we wonder, how much, how much more can this world take? When is Jesus coming back? Soon. Very soon. Oh, Doug, how soon is soon? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Stay tuned to the sermon. We'll see if we can answer that for you. Jesus said that when we see these signs, look up. He said our redemption is drawing near. Okay, so we don't have to be afraid. Jesus said that he will see us through the time of trouble. But how? Well, frankly, some will be laid down to sleep in the grave. Okay, Jesus knows what's best, and we have to leave it up to him. Others will be equipped through his grace and through his strength to take a stand for him. And it will be our faith that will see us through this time of trouble. Okay? Ellen White wrote in the book uh, Early Writings about her first vision. 
And it was a vision where she was lifted up. And she saw the journey of the Advent people. And they were on this straight and narrow path. And at the end was this bright shining light and Jesus was there. And as long as the Advent people, by faith, stayed on that path, then they didn't fall off into the great precipice. But it was by faith. So it's by faith that we are going to get through the time of trouble. Right? So how's your faith today? Do you believe that Jesus will return in your lifetime? You know, for centuries, people have believed that they would see Jesus return in their lifetime, but it didn't happen. The apostles and the people in the early churches from, from the New Testament, they all believed that they were going to see Jesus return in their lifetime, but it didn't happen. The Millerites thought for sure they were going to see Jesus return in their lifetime, but we know that didn't happen. The early church leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist movement, people like Ellen White, Ellen and James White, and J.N. Andrews, Hiram Edson, all of these people, Joseph Bates, they all thought for sure they were going to see Jesus return in their lifetime. But it didn't happen. How many precious saints have we known who have laid down to go to sleep in the grave who all thought for sure they were going to see Jesus return in their lifetime. But it didn't happen. Are we looking for his return, or are we stuck right where we're at? You know, I've heard young people say before, well, I don't want Jesus coming back until um, I get married and have children. Now, getting married and having children is a wonderful thing. But it doesn't compare to the glories of paradise when Jesus takes us home. I've even heard people say to me, I don't want Jesus coming back until my favorite team wins the Super Bowl. I'm sorry, I'm not waiting for the Cincinnati Bengals to win the Super Bowl in order to go back home with Christ. Okay? I think it boils down to a matter of priorities. What are your priorities? Have you totally surrendered your heart to Christ? If not, what are you waiting for? Right? Because you see, Jesus is coming back soon. Oh, but how soon is soon? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Stay tuned to the sermon. We'll see if we can answer that for you. Some people, I wonder, if they're caught up in what's called analysis paralysis. Have you ever heard of this before? I used to be in sales, and we used to see it in sales. You know, when you're in sales and you're getting ready, especially in business sales, business to business, and you're getting ready to approach a company, well, you want to know about your company, so you do a little bit of research so you know the best way to approach them. And sometimes it's usually a young salesman who's very, very nervous, and they just analyze and analyze and analyze and analyze, but they never do anything. They never make any money because they can't make a sale because they can't take that step forward. They call that analysis paralysis. Okay? Can that happen to Christians? I think it can. Absolutely. You could have somebody who studies the Bible. They know all the original languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. Right? They know this. They know that. But do they know the author of the book? Are they paralyzed in making a decision? What's holding them back? Are they afraid to make that commitment? You know, a big reason to be ready now is because, frankly, no one knows how much more time each one of us has here on this earth. Right? Not one of us here has a contract for tomorrow. In fact, you could say that we are all on borrowed time. You don't even have a guarantee you're going to see the sunset tonight. Now, I'm not trying to be negative or morbid or anything like that. I'm just trying to be realistic. The breath in your lungs is a gift from God. The beating of your heart is a gift from God. I want you to do something. God gives you this, these gifts because he loves you. So there's something I want you to do. I want you to find your pulse. 
I want you to take your first two fingers and put them on your wrist. Okay? Don't use your thumb because your thumb has a pulse. Right? But use first two fingers. Now, I guarantee you, if you're sitting upright right now, you have a pulse. Okay? So find your pulse. Can you feel it? Can you feel it beating? Now I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I want you to close your eyes, keep your fingers on your pulse, concentrate on the pulse. Feel each beat go under your fingers. And with each beat, I want you to hear Jesus say to you, I love you, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I want you to hear that because it's true. Because Jesus loves you. That's why you have a pulse. That's why your heart is beating. He gives you this gift because he loves you. You can take your fingers off now if you want. You know, it's said that we're all just one heartbeat away from eternity. If you don't wake up tomorrow morning, then as far as you're concerned, prophecy has been fulfilled. Right? It's game over, so to speak. Your next conscious thought is when Christ calls you out of the grave. And as students of the Bible, we don't have to fear death. Right? We, and when we lose a loved one, when a loved one is laid down to rest in the grave... We have that hope that we will see them again. But the fact of the matter is, none of us know how much time we have left on this earth. And again, I don't want to focus on death. I'd rather focus on eternal life with Jesus Christ. You know, we as Christians, we can claim the promise in 1 Corinthians 51 through 53, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And to that, I say, praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But there are those people out there who don't believe this. But the Bible prophesied that they were, there would be these people. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3, 3 and 4 say, Knowing this first, that first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. Have you ever heard anybody like that? I have. I'm sure you have too. I remember when I first learned this message and I was trying to share it with people I love, family members. Oh, Doug, I've heard that for 60 years. He's still not here. It's true. It's, it's true. We know it's true. We can see, we can look around and we can see the prophecies from Daniel and Revelation and see how they've been fulfilled. We can see that the next great event is the blessed hope. The return of Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is returning very soon. Oh, but how soon is soon? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. We'll see if we can answer that for you. First, I want to make a couple of appeals to you today. You know, some, I've been asked before, Doug, why do you end every sermon with an appeal? Well, because Sister White counsels us that we should end every message with an appeal. We should treat every message like it's possibly somebody's very last message they're ever going to hear. So that's why I make an appeal on every sermon. My first appeal, there's three appeals. My first appeal is if you have not totally surrendered your heart, if something has been held back, I'm inviting you, I'm, I, I'm asking you to make that decision today. 
Put aside whatever's in the way, whatever's cluttering the throne room of your heart, put it aside and surrender totally to Jesus Christ. My second appeal is, for those of us Christians who have surrendered, do it again. Do it again. Do it every day. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. That's good advice. And my third appeal is to share this message with somebody. Share it today. You know, the time of being shy and timid is over. Okay, we don't have that luxury anymore. Right? Jesus is coming back soon. Oh, but how soon is soon? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. We'll see if we can answer that for you. You know, I think it's sad when somebody rejects Christ. That's so sad. To me, it's even sadder when they didn't even hear about him. And it's our mission to tell them. Now, throughout my sermon today, I've been teasing you about how soon is soon. You want me to answer that? Let me give you the answer. When Jesus is coming back, it will happen right on time. That's when he's coming. If it happened a day earlier, it'd be too soon. If it happened a day later, it'd be too late. You know, in the book Desire of Ages, page 31, God, uh, Ellen White says, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. Jesus is always right on time. He will return soon. But again, the question is, well, Doug, how soon is soon? When is Jesus coming back, Doug? Did you know the answers in the Bible? Did you know Jesus told us when he's coming back? Did you, know, did you miss that in your Bible studies? Maybe you, maybe you, you missed this part. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy in this book. Verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes, we are going through birth pains right now. And yes, it's going to get much worse before it gets better. <clears throat> I pray that each one of us, by faith, will hang on to Christ. And by faith, we'll stand strong for Jesus. Because Jesus is coming back very soon. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Happy Sabbath. Once again, I'm glad that you were with us today for this service and you could enjoy it. And we hope that you'll remember that you're always welcome to come and be part of our service right here in our church, which is at 241 of Province Street in Laconia. And our services are on Saturday morning, starting at 9.30 for the study, 11 o'clock for the worship service. Uh, so come and, and join us. I think you'll find a warm welcome here at our church. God bless you today and every day as you study the Bible and draw closer to Him.